hello and welcome to the mergers funding and valuations panel. Um, my name is Ann Donahoe. I am a managing director at KCSA Strategic Communications um, and the co-host of the Green Rush podcast. Um, and I am so excited to be joined um, by the following panelists. Bruce Linton, um, a, a gentleman who wears many hats, but uh, <laughs> because we only have 45 minutes, he is the chair of the advisory board uh, with Red Light Holland um, and board member of MindMed. Um, Derek Ham, who is the managing director of Canaccord Genuity, uh, and Richard Carlton, director and CEO of the Canadian Ex uh, uh, Securities Exchange. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so, analysts, predictions, uh, in the psychedelics market, we only have 45 minutes, but I'm sure we'll figure it all out, right? <laughs> um, Derek, I'd like to start with you. Um, we, where are we in the maturity of the market? First inning, second inning, no innings? Yet, uh, these sectors, cannabis and uh, psychedelics, generally have moved very quickly through these innings. And, uh, I'd say the first inning is uh, is done. We've we've got these companies sort of structured. They're they're, they're they've raised capital. They're now publicly traded, and uh, and I think I'm moving into the second inning where they got to start, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing what they say they're going to do. You know, accelerating their business projects and the like. Uh, so I'd say yeah, second inning. You guys agree with that? Yeah, it's um, you've made the team. Nice warm up. Show me. So you're bang on, Derek. It's like, and if the story had a calendar attached to it, you cannot erase the calendar. That was written actually in ink. So the people put the capital and expect schedule and result. You know, you brought up, uh, Derek, you brought up cannabis and psychedelics, and they're often compared fairly or not. Um, but if we look um, at cannabis 1.0 versus psychedelics 1.0, you know, what's the difference? Bruce, in cannabis 1.0, there was this wave of companies that, you know, ran out of cash and a wave of, of industry consolidation and M&A. How do you compare or not cannabis with psychedelics at this stage? Well, a lot of people forget that Canada had about a 12-year stretching exercise, right? Like the courts began to say 12 years before the Tories put in the uh, 2013 structure that you could you could have access, and I think the total accumulated patients was about 36,000 over 12 years. And so, if you're thinking about like how does that apply to uh, people who are going to have medical access to psilocybin in Canada, I bet we go faster, but I bet it's not a, a one-year project. And then. Um, I don't know. If, is anybody else hearing the sound of a airplane in the background? Or is that just buzzing at my house? Um, the um, <laughs> the other parts where you start to say the regulated parts. So think Red Light Holland. Red Light Holland is selling to adults who want to buy it. You do not have to have a medical reason. So that's kind of like 2.0 early. But how many jurisdictions have that? And you got the bigger ones, the mind meds, the ties, et cetera, which are trying to de-risk clinical trials. Something works on you. Now, how much works on you? What's it work for? And so I think they could be like a much more near term than a biotech play to have an answer. So it's almost like watching three games at once. And for investors and companies in the sector, you have to you have to invest that way. Otherwise, you're going to the casino and put it all on red 12. Um, <laughs> I think you need to look across which portfolios in which way. Anything to add there, Richard? Yeah, I think there's uh, one of the key differences and uh, Bruce touched on it is Cannabis has clearly matured into a consumer packaged goods type industry, and uh, with with all that that entails, uh, you know, mass markets, brand development, advertising, uh, you know, different uh, delivery modalities, and so on. Whereas uh, the psychedelic space is really a combination of, and and again, it's not straight traditional pharma research either, um, because we're in this weird situation where we have substantial old clinical data which mm -hmm. tells us there's there there for a number of these compounds so we know and uh, you know that uh, work is being confirmed by some of the early work that's uh, being done by a number of the companies both public and private at this point so we know there will be positive therapeutic benefits for a whole ver range of these compounds for a range of uh, of issues but again, because many of these things have been used you know, by humans for five to 7,000 years at least, we have uh, different intellectual property issues than pharma normally has to deal with. Uh, patent protection for uh, 
uh, Warashko or some of these other compounds is going to be exceedingly difficult uh, to obtain. We also have uh, the, the treatment modalities may be different as well. Uh, so instead of a pill at night and a pill in the morning uh, for the rest of your life, uh, you're looking at a combination of psychotherapy and use of the compounds um, over a relatively short period of time. So the business model is also challenging. So again, investors can't think of it really as cannabis uh, 2.0, and they shouldn't think of it as traditional pharma either. Um, but that said, we know there are tremendous opportunities uh, to uh, address some very, very significant uh, issues in, in, in mental health in particular in society with the use of these compounds. You know, Richard, we have seen, um, you know, the the CSC and the Canadian exchanges, um, you know, really take a leadership role. You know, as, as Bruce said, you know, you guys had um, a couple of years practice stretching, right? If we're going to continue with the, with the analogy here, um, you know, following the success in, in the cannabis sector, you know, can you just tell us why, why, you know, you guys have decided to, to, you know, jump full, you know, both feet in to the psychedelic sector? Well, I think there's a, there are sort of two or three obvious reasons. Um, the first one is that, uh, yes, we did develop a reputation um, of, uh, of working with new industries uh, as a result of our work in the cannabis space. And many of the early stage investors uh, were similar. Uh, and uh, so the, the disclosure uh, approaches that, that we developed, again, very similar, uh, focus on the regulation and the jurisdiction that the company is uh, prepared to operate, uh, our willingness to accept the company's uh, uh, representations and warranties that they're operating in accordance with the applicable law in the local jurisdiction, again, is, uh, is, is ground that is well understood uh, by us. But the other point that the international audiences should understand is that uh, uh, Canada is a very attractive price point for uh, early stage uh, public capital. And so, you know, the, the starting point in the United States is a market capitalization of at least a billion dollars. Whereas in Canada, uh, we can bring companies to the public markets, which we've been doing for years across a whole variety of uh, sectors um, in, you know, the 10 to 20 to $30 million range and capital is available to fund these sorts of companies. So um, with the stigma that is, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that it's still attached uh, to this space, uh, the history of the cannabis uh, investment and the success of many of those companies uh, coming to the Canadian public markets, uh, I think was an obvious choice for many of these companies. Derek, there's been this trend in dual listing. So a company, you know, can list in Canada on, on an exchange like the CSE um, and in the U.S. on the OTC or the NASDAQ. Um, can you talk to our listeners a little bit about the differences in the exchanges and what's the benefit of a dual listing or multiple listing? Yeah, uh, Richard answered uh, some of it, but you, you know, to the to the point, uh, you know, access to capital and 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 speed to market uh, is you know critical in these fast moving um, sectors, and psychedelics being one of them. And you know, the the process to get listed uh, uh, on the CSE is much quicker than uh, than trying to access the uh, U.S. market. Um, you know, to uh, to Richard's point, uh, you know, a twenty or thirty or forty million dollar company can uh, can access investors and the Canadian capital markets within three months, and you just wouldn't see that. Uh, if these guys tried to list uh, in 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 the U.S., they, there would be time. Uh, the the regulatory hurdles are much uh, deeper, and so what we've all often recommended is uh, you know list first uh, on the CSE in Canada, get get your sort of early capital in and and you know we've got an investor base in Canada that is uh, you know much less risk averse or are, are willing to fund these emerging industries and uh, so that's what we see uh, and then uh, the next step we encourage people you know if they're big enough and they've got the viewership to, 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 to move to NASDAQ and that gives them access I think the real difference is, is just the access to a whole new uh, group of investors that you, you wouldn't you wouldn't have that access to in, in Canada so well and you think about uh, you know when we worked together Derek on MindMed that first offering call it 20 months ago you know you, you, you could barely drag people to talk about the topic and put cash in 
Um, but once you start having a momentum, I, I can't even keep track. I think we did four bot deals maybe with you guys, could yeah. be five. Um, but the, mo the momentum to build the capital and what happens is when you fill your bank account up is your accountants quit putting something in the statements called going concern risk. And so having cash eliminates that not pleasant reference. And then all of a sudden you meet that beautiful thing, the foreign issuer exemption. So you can be listed both in Canada and on the NASDAQ without all of the filings and still have access to all the great Canadian instruments while having the prestige. And so like, um, if people are setting up their company, they should look at what are the criteria for the foreign issuer exemption and plan your cap table around it. Plan, you know, your compliance around it because what is it about one year and a day and you're eligible to start thinking about it from the time you're listed. Uh, and so I'm seeing a lot of companies that have to do a lot of reworking to get there where it's a lot easier to think about it on the front end. Yeah. And and one of the other things, and, and again, this isn't uh, an advertisement for the CSC only, it's uh, really for all Canadian public companies, regardless of which exchange they're listed on, is they do have access to the US market uh, for a lot of prospectus exempt capital. So private yeah. placements and Reg A plus and a whole variety of uh, tools can be used to build a US shareholder base, build a following before you've even taken the step uh, to acquire a US listing as well. So um, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility that you have as a Canadian reporting issuer uh, as an early stage company, really in, in all sectors, but in this one is, is particularly important. And, and we've seen that, um, you know, companies on the CSE in the space have raised $375 million in the first six months uh, of uh, 2021. Um, so it's uh, clearly attracting a lot of investor attention and not all that money is Canadian. A uh, significant percentage of it is coming out of the US. I wonder, have we seen, I know Gage, we did a Reg A for a marijuana company, but have we seen a Reg A yet in the, I'll call it psychedelics or psychedelics inspired? Because that, that would actually canvas a great deal of public support, I bet, in the US. I don't yeah, believe so yet, Bruce. Hmm. Well, there's an idea for someone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with all of these, you know, emerging industries, there's this trend um, of, you know, verticalization and then consolidation. Um, you know, we've already seen it, you know, with Enveric buying Magic Med and then most recently with SciTech and Wisana. Um, are these outliers or are, are they are they the first and we're, we're about to see more or are we still kind of seeing these companies, you know, still still building before they they start like the M&A fervor? Well, maybe like. Crezzo, right? <laughs> Getting squished by red light. Like, um, I, I think depending on where you are, you're either accumulating breadcrumbs of revenue across multiple options so that you grow a bottom line in profitability, or you're accumulating breadcrumbs of science so you de risk your likelihood of winning on a breakthrough drug. And to me, um, I think everyone should have a risk mitigation downside protection strategy. And usually that means aggregating with other people in a like field, but not doing the identical work. So if you're the most genius person with LSD in Switzerland, maybe you feel more comfortable joining MindMed because it means that you're de-risking your optionality and it's going to work. So I, I just think um, these are going to happen more and more. And Derek's going to be a busy person having the consolidation process because M&A um, means you can actually usually finance after because you're stronger and bigger. Derek, um, any thoughts there? Yeah, you know, I, I, we look at it from a sort of perspective of cost to capital and sort of liquidity. So companies like MindMed have, you know, it's a general, I'm generalizing the term, but unlimited access to capital at, uh, at very reasonable costs. And that will hinder some of the smaller companies who, who don't have that access to capital. And because of that, are going to be forced to make a decision. And uh, you know, you, do you wait and stay standalone or do you, do, do you join up with someone like MindMed, Atai, Compass, Sybin, those that have, uh, and I know there are some other big ones that I, I don't want to leave them out, but uh, that's what's going to happen. Those with have access to capital will start acquiring the, uh, the, the, the companies that don't. Yep. Do you think that um, that the the current marketplace with with COVID and with this Delta variant is any of that affecting how investors are thinking about um, you know investing in in psychedelics? Yesterday um, was a bad day, wasn't it, Derek? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I think, you know, the, the spin and, uh, and uh, you know, MindMed was very good at it, just talking about sort of, you know, the mental health that people are going to come out of this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, uh, the 18 months, two years of COVID, and we're already seeing mental health issues in children, teenagers, uh, we're, we're hearing uh, stories about PTSD. And so uh, I, I think the sector overall plays very well in, in uh, these trends of alcoholism and me mental health. Yeah, I think uh, another one of the key issues that uh, coming out of the uh, pandemic is uh, opiate addiction. Uh, the, the death rates have gone through the roof in uh, middle America and middle Canada uh, to the point where it's actually now affecting uh, life expectancy numbers, uh, uh, particularly for males. And, um, you know, th these are issues uh, combined with anxiety. Uh, which is another will be another significant mental health issue as uh, people re-engage um, that uh, uh, you know again we have really solid early indications uh, that there are positive outcomes uh, from a variety of these uh, treatment modalities that are being explored yeah and, and, and all that speaks to I think in some of the big shops you mentioned attracting institutional investors ever more you know the sorts that call up the big banks and say hey can you get i want a meeting with these people what's your analyst coverage on it that whole maturing and then it's going to i think in some of the smaller ones um it's going to make people have better conversations about the topic of mental health and even animal health all kinds of things and they're going to actually say what 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 do i own that i believe in this what do i own and so i think it's i don't think um I've not had the sense that COVID has negatively impacted this, uh, frankly, in any way. Um, Do you think, if anything, it brings in a crop of investors who, you know, may have been looking at the space and and are are you know risk tolerant, but maybe they want more of a um, a biotech stock or more of a healthcare stock? Are you are you seeing more people come in because that is more attractive to them? And that's a question for anybody. Go ahead, Derek. You're, you're living that more front line. Yeah, you know, in, in Canada, it varies. But certainly, I think, uh, uh, you know, in, in many aspects, uh, the, the, uh, the big U.S. institutions are, are, are looking for fact-based, science-backed uh, companies. And that tends to focus more on sort of the, the bi biotech nature of, uh, of the sector. Yep. I was going to say that the um, outside of the private placement investors, uh, who are institutions of various kind, many of whom had positive experience in working with the cannabis industry in its early days. Um, the, the, the investor is predominantly retail and skews significantly younger uh, than the, uh, you know, the broader investing uh, public demographic. Uh, so yeah, I think there's definitely something to that and that uh, uh, you know, people do want to support uh, with their investment dollars, something that they believe in, uh, something that they believe can make life better and address uh, key issues for society. Uh, I don't think there's uh, any doubt that uh, uh, some of those portfolios have psychedelic companies, cannabis companies, uh, uh, meat substitute companies, and uh, various other uh, issuers that are uh, looking to address uh, significant societal issues. Mm. Are you guys having to deal with um, the understanding that you know your return, your the biotech side of it, the research side, the drug commercialization side is a long play, um, and you know a lot of these, you know, especially from and I keep comparing to cannabis because that's my background, but you know a lot of people expected a quick turnaround, a quick uh, expected um, you know to to see their dollars you know work a little bit faster, but it takes something like two billion dollars to bring a drug to market. Is that a message that that you guys are finding that you're having to um, to preach a little bit more, or is the is the marketplace understand or is the investment marketplace understanding of this? Well, Derek, maybe you or whoever. First. I was going to say, like, when when I looked at these things first two years ago, um, my analysis still is the same then as it is today, which is these things actually have efficacy on humans. We know that. We know that they, depending on what we're talking about, uh, even safety and, and, and toxicity and things, we, we've got a pretty good handle on that. What we don't have is a containerization of titration and indication. And so I think it's a massively de-risked approach to having an outcome you get a lot of value for. And it's just because of stupidity of rules that that really mega return potential exists 
because you couldn't actually bring it through the process, which you can now. And so I think like um, bringing things to a end of a phase two clinical trial is way faster, way cheaper, and you'll have a portfolio of things. So people will call you. If you get the first one done in a year, year and a quarter, Derek will call and say, I have um, a large pharma company that would like to do a licensing deal, maybe buy you guys. And what we do is you'd license the first one in for a few hundred million, and that becomes your cash flow validation to go to take the next two, three, four through the whole process and bring them out the other side for way less than two billion. Because two billion, I think, captures all the messes they made in trying to invent molecules without killing mice. We're way past that. And so I think you're going to see the first one maybe gets licensed in, and then the second and third you carry all the way through. So I, I'm always more optimistic about this space to get there faster. And I think the cannabis space had way less science and way less efficacy in terms of the ingredients than this. Who do you think is going to get there first? Yeah, I, I think you're going to have any one of the big three or four are all going to start reading data out. Yeah. And I, I'd also add just quickly, I know you want to keep moving on. It's, uh, you know, if you're going to go out and try and just pick, pick one company and hope, uh, I hope you're going to get a return and, uh, you know, that's the quickest way to lose money. And <laughs> in, in biotech, because of, uh, you know, the, the long tail, uh, unknown, you have to have a portfolio approach here. It's the, it's the only way that uh, you, that's your downside protection by, by just diversifying in the sector. So I've had a bunch of floor polishers uh, show up, uh, which is uh, why you hear <laughs> that hum in the background. Uh, what I was going to say is that uh, you know Canada does have long experience uh, with the mining industry, and I can assure you that it takes a very, very long time from the first uh, hole in the ground to a producing mine, uh, 12 to 15 years uh, on average. So there is some understanding that uh, um, it may take a while before uh, the complete investment returns are received. But uh, Bruce and, and Derek are obviously bang on that uh, this is something that, you know, again, because of the body of knowledge that's been accumulated to date, uh, it, it shouldn't take as long as the classic uh, pharma uh, outcome. We talked uh, kind of around this, but the more direct question is how easy is it to raise money right now? And and are the sources of capital similar as other stage, early stage industries? And and should we be expected to see kind of the spigot turn off anytime soon? Well, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, look, uh, the top five, six players uh, that have, have the liquidity uh, are gonna have the ability to raise capital at sort of any time they want. Uh, what we're seeing now is just, you know, there was a, there was a rush, rush to, to the public markets, as Richard knows. And so, you know, within 18 months, I think there's been 30, uh, 30 companies going public. And, uh, you know, a lot of those companies, uh, you know, there was a euphoria initially, and now things are settling down. And uh, there's going, there's, we're starting to see the winners and losers, right? And what? so... Yeah, keep, keep going. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, right now for some of the smaller companies, they're, you know, they're under some of many are underwater from their, their go public. And, uh, you know, there, there's a hesitancy by investors to, to, to step in right now. You know, think things could change that. Well, and the way I the way I picture it, I, maybe it's because I grew up on a farm and we had one of those really old fashioned like a pump, you know, you you, you push it and pull it. And it, what happens with those pumps is at one point in time, you're working hard and nothing's coming out. And then when you move your hand back up the other way, the water's flowing up and then you got to push again. So it ebbs and flows, but you're always working. And when you're working the hardest, you're not actually always seeing the water. And so I think what's going to happen is what happens every time, there's going to be a handful of companies that work with Eric and the crew and they do a bunch of non-deal road shows and they stay in everybody's face and they make the commitments and they show the schedule and all of a sudden they get super lucky in October and get big fundraising outcomes because they've actually done the work. And so I hope a lot of these new ones are making Derek work this summer because <laughs> it, 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 there's no way that money um, is not sleeping in summers anymore. So I just I think um, anybody listening to this should be continuously optimistic, effort filled and expect success about three months from now. Yeah. Richard, do you agree? Well, capital is supposed to be scarce. <laughs> it is. Uh, and uh, as Bruce says, um, yes, there is a willing audience uh, for the companies that are prepared to put in the work. 
but uh, you know, as much as I'd like to say the streets of Toronto and, and Vancouver and Calgary and Montreal are paved with gold, uh, that would be a bit of a lie. <laughs> Um, you know, so I guess that, that also begs the question of how fairly valued is the industry right now? Um, and I know it may be a little bit premature to say that, and we're in kind of a funky market. Um, but you know, where, where is the market finding value now? There's everything from the, the smaller, you know, um, 50 million, hundred million dollar market cap to the, to the ties, the mind meds and the compasses of the world. Um, where, where, where's the value right now? Um, you know, I, I, the, the value valuation in the sector has been very tricky from day one. Uh, you know, trying to uh, you know, some were trying to compare it to cannabis, others were trying to compare it to the biotech sector, and you know, I, I think value today is is probably liquidity. And so, uh, you know, if you're an institutional investor, it's uh, it's okay to uh, to uh, to uh, you know. Uh, invest in some of these smaller names, but I would say value is just liquidity, getting into names that are liquid that you can get uh, in and out of based on, you know, changes in the re regulatory uh, regimes, et cetera. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, well, I, I think in some of the companies you're competing increasingly with the perception of portfolio managers. And in some of the smaller companies, you're competing with the perceptions of press releases. And so um, I, I really just think you have to be comfortable dividing the world into multiple pieces. But um, if a portfolio manager at an institution is buying the stocks at whatever prices they're at, let's assume they probably finished at least grade 10 math and they have some perception of the market. So uh, I'm comfortable they're probably running analysis, which is what's the total addressable markets, how close to taking away and how disruptable, how shitty are the alternate products currently being the best in market? And so I think that there's a thoughtful process in at least the top four because people are looking at those. In the other one, um, keep all the press releases. Tell me if you told me that you're going to have it done Tuesday that was done Tuesday. And I think there's another important point that uh, everybody always forgets, but, uh, you know, you, especially in the early stage space, you've got to have a look at the cap table. So yeah. how much cheap stock did the founders get? How, much, how big is the float? Uh, what is the volume of press releases coming from the company look like? Is it, does it look and smell and feel maybe like more of a promotion than in fact a company that's uh, trying to execute on serious business goals? And again, add to that, as Bruce said, you know, benchmark the uh, achievements of the company against the promises that have been made in their uh, disclosure materials and in the press releases. And uh, you know, you can pretty well, uh, by using that approach, uh, figure out who's serious and who's really just trying to make a quick buck from uh, uh, from a turn. Uh, if we, uh, if I could stay on press releases for a second, because it's kind of where where we live. <laughs> um, you know, we spend you know a decent amount of our time you know talking clients out of writing press releases, out of putting out news. Yes. Um, but there is this there is this push. There is this almost like fervent. I need to be putting news out on a on a weekly or or you know sometimes a couple of times a week uh, basis um, to to get my name in the news to get my even if it if, if it may not be material news um, you know why is there this this fervor to get all to get all of this out you know when when Bruce to your point it's like just tell me you know tell me what you're gonna do tell me when you did it um, you know w w why is this why is this particular to this industry, um, well, you know, this, this flood of, of releases going out the door. I, I would say that press releases and small cap Canadian companies have had a long and interesting history. Um, I, I think the point of a press release is to inform shareholders of a material uh, achievement for which they should uh, uni uniformly be made aware. Um, we've drifted a long way from that sometime. Um, I, I tend to not like that, but I know like, there's a lot of shareholders that think you're dead as a CEO if you didn't get a press release out in at least the last three days. And so there's constant pressure to the CEOs. Um, my view to express to them is they're usually trying to get you to put a lot of press releases out, not because they're buying more of your stock. So like, think about the long term of the company, they're trying to sell your stock. Derek, any advice there? Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, inv investors start to lose 
sort of interest or line of sight after, you, you, you know, you pay attention to, uh, you know, important press releases. You, you may stop paying attention to companies that are press releasing too much. That's that's the risk. Yeah. Um, and the news that that is of interest will then tend to be lost because, you know, you've put out 47 press releases and maybe one or two are the material ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, Bruce, can we talk? And I know that, you know, you're I want to talk about lessons learned from managing the early stages of cannabis to the early stages of psychedelics. So what lessons have you taken from that to this industry? Um, maybe a few for sure. When you have a chance to raise your raise right? Um, cash is king. Second thing is that um, applied science is actually more valuable for the first three to five years than deep R&D for a lot of players. So like, what, what can we do with this when? And so you're seeing a lot of places actually moving very quickly to phase two trials, because I would call it almost applied science, gathering of other people's efforts to put it into a believable framework. Um, and maybe the third is that, um, Entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs, and generally the board's job should be to be to cheer for the entrepreneurs. And it doesn't matter what sector you're in, tech to this. Um, so the ob obligation of the entrepreneur is to be genuine in what they want to do, not just you know get rich quick. But the obligation of the boards to support that. And uh, you know, for all this stuff, that it, it takes a lot of energy for whoever has that job of being the CEO. And so we see across the sector different outcomes, but um, I tend to push the idea that. Um, we better raise every time we can. If somebody if somebody calls with a bot deal, you're usually trying to negotiate better terms, not walk away, um, and then uh, move forward with how you're using the current science. Derek, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, what have I learned? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to stump you. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, yeah, just. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the emerging industries just, uh, you know, need, need capital, need capital and need a lot of it. And uh, to, to Bruce's point, uh, you know, we, we're bankers, so we'll say it, but if the money's there, you should take it, right? Because you never know if it's not going to be there down the road. So that's why we're always negotiating with Bruce on better terms. <laughs> <laughs> Do you win? Do you often win? No. We've okay. got, he's, he's a good, very good negotiator. But how many deals have we done? Maybe, God, across all things, 20? You've done, I would say, we're, we're up north of 10. Yeah, but the, the fact is, there's there's two or three folks who always show up to play. Danacord's one of them. Danacord mm -hmm. wasn't the first mover or shaker in marijuana. But guess what? When they put their head down and push, they were the, the game. So I think in you know, in cannabis and in psychedelics, there's always two or three that are gonna be playing super hard to win. And if you're not knowing and connecting to them, you better get on the radar. Derek, what were the conversations like, you know, three, four years ago, maybe that's even too long, um, you know, when when you guys are starting to talk with people in the space, was it, um, you know, do we wanna dip our toe in or was it like, let's go? You know, uh, the mind med raise sort of what was, as Bruce mentioned, it, w it was a grind. Um, you know, <laughs> no Canadian institutions had any interest. Most of the uh, money was coming in with the help of uh, the, the co-founders. And uh, what we saw was um, a lot of sort of high net worth U.S. Uh, family offices, hedge, fa hedge fund owners coming in personally. And it got done. It, uh, you know, the stock traded up right away, and uh, sort of the, the floodgates opened. So, you know, there was uh, there was always going to be a compa comparison to those that were, uh, were, were, were that were going public and what they were worth. So, you know, the hardest part of it as a banker was just negotiating what 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 real value was. You know, what valuation to go public because we didn't have a lot of companies. So. You know, they they point to MindMed really as as sort of the uh, the first mover. So there was always a comparison to well, what are we worth relative to uh, to uh, MindMed early days? And now, are you getting? More, is it easier now? 
Maybe that's an unfair question. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, there's so many players and and so many parts of the uh, sector that it, it it's 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 yeah. there's enough companies there to sort of get get some value some, some valuation metrics, but uh, it's not it's not that much easier. Um, how important are IP portfolios to investors? I know that there's this, you know, race between um, the the maps and the the usonas of the world. Um, you know, more of an open science, and then you know everybody else is is you know working to patent you know derivatives of the molecules and and all of this other stuff around it. How important are, are investors really looking at that and being like, I want to I want to see, I want to understand, you know, what the patent strategy is, um, or is that something that kind of secondary to investor interest i'll uh you know in, in canada in canada they're small cap players the, the wealth managers uh are more focused on uh you know the the, the business at hand i i think when you start getting into the larger institutional uh biotech funds and healthcare funds down in the uh, states that's when we really see them uh, deep dive in 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 uh, patent protection and and the likes because that's your protection. You and know? again, yeah, and I think what that speaks to, again, is the difference in approaches that we're seeing amongst the public companies. So yeah, very traditional pharma type uh, company has to focus on its intellectual property portfolio uh, because that's how the serious investors uh, view and value these companies. Whereas uh, you know, in, in Bruce's case and a number of others, we've got companies that are looking to be in revenue uh, as quickly as possible in a variety of jurisdictions around the world. And at that point, it becomes much more of an operating company than something that is uh, looking to bring a significant revenue generating product to market in you know five years or eight years or whatever. Yeah, and I think there's that funny middle ground. Part of the reason I wanted, and I like Creso going together with Red Light is, what if you've done work in say Switzerland so that you put it through a process that you can just make claims that this will work for your dog. If it weighs this many kilograms, feed it this much, it will make it less anxious when you go away, just as a theoretical one. So there's this, there's this super deep IP, and then there's a center where you trust it. And then there's brands and revenue that you say, that's my choice. And so I think you're going to see all of that spectrum play out and be valued differentially. Clearly, if you have super powerful IP and the product works, that's like a home run after home run after home run, but there's a lot of value along the spectrum. Um, well, part of it, so part of this panel um, is talking prediction. So I wanna go around the horn and see, um, Richard, what are your predictions? Where are we, and you can do it with, where are we in a year? Where are we in five years? Where are we in 10 years? You know, pick your timeline. Well, I've actually got pretty good visibility for the next six months because uh, basically we've seen the applications or are working with the, you know, Derek and some of the other bankers active in the space already on what we will see for the remainder of the year. And we know that there are a number of other companies coming to market. Um, it's going to continue to be a very solid sector uh, for the CSE, for Canadian uh, early stage exchanges uh, for, for the remainder of the year. Um, I guess what I'm most excited about, Anne, uh, is, uh, you know, the potential benefit uh, and not in pharma time, but uh, I think there's some some real applications for genuine wellness uh, in a much shorter time frame than we would ordinarily expect. And, uh, you know, ab above all of the business considerations, that's what I'm really looking forward to are meaningful approaches to addiction, anxiety, PTSD, depression, which has resisted, um, you know, treatments. Uh, um, I, that, that's where I, I, I'm most excited. And based on what I've heard to date uh, from a number of the industry leaders, we're going to get there. We're, we're, going to, we're going to make a lot of people's lives a lot better than they would have been uh, without all of this uh, investment work, entrepreneurship, and so on in the space. So, I, 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 yeah, it's going to be messy. Uh, but I think we're going to get to a much better place in the uh, in the three year time horizon. Derek, yeah, I think I think we'll see yeah, some continued financings going into the fall, as 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 per Richard. But uh, you know, I also think we're we're, we're probably getting into the early early days of uh, a lot of M and A activity. So we'll we'll see new companies emerge, and we'll see uh, 
you know, some of the existing companies uh, uh, get gobbled up. And are that you, has to be- uh, are, uh, when you talk about M and A, um, are you know, are you talking the you know the J and Js of the world jumping in, or are they? I mean, I guess technically they're already in, but you know, big pharma stepping in. Are you? Is that where you're where you're talking about? Or are we talking about the consolidation within within the industry itself? I, I think two twofold. One, uh, I think we could start seeing some uh, some some of the big bi- biotech companies uh, stepping in. But I think they're mo- more focused on probably derivatives of what's already been approved. So, uh, you know, a ketamine mixed with something else that's approved because it's, it's, it's a much easier path. I think these large biotechs want solutions now, as do, do uh, people with mental health issues. Uh, you know, they want solutions now. And so I think that's where, where we'll see the, uh, some of the bigger biotechs come in. Uh, on the smaller side, you, you know, I, I think we could see some of the uh, smaller, co- those that have access to capital merge with those that don't. And that can be at a- 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 any size. Yeah. My, mine, I would say that um, I think mismanaged molecules didn't get the memo on why they have to be stay apart from each other and be put in a psychedelics or a THC. <laughs> so I think, like, I think this whole... They're so rogue. No, I, th- I, I think this whole intellectual constraint, capital market constraint, that things all stay in their swim lanes is going to completely disintegrate over the next 12 months. And I think it's going to disintegrate, disintegrate most rapidly for people. If you're in favor and comfortable with THC as a, a regulated adult choice, I bet you're not way outside the circle of comfort when you start talking about truffles and psilocybin. So I think you're going to start to see society evolve, science adopt. And that's going to do two things. One, it's going to change and, and evolve what we put in clinical trials, and it's going to change and put pressure on what regulators do. And, I, and the best outcome of COVID is that everybody's financially desperate that runs any government anywhere. Um, so they're going to be a much more thoughtful crowd on, are there streams of revenue I should regulate? Because then they can monetize it, and then they can educate. And so I just think there's going to be... Um, mismanaged molecules aren't going to be willing to just keep these categorical boundaries. Are there milestones that that you you guys all kind of have on your on your radar? You know, um, that that you want to share with everybody. So the you know when X Y Z company you know does this, when Maps does this, when you know is there is there something, or even from a regulatory standpoint in the U S. or Canada, uh, what should what should investors have their eye on? For me, uh, some of the big guys reading data, we have now put this many people in this many scenarios. This is what we got. Reading data can actually be terrific or really not terrific. So as investors, that milestone doesn't always turn out to be, and it worked perfect, but that's going to be a key thing. Richard, what do you think? What milestones are you looking at? Well, I think we've touched on them. Um, you know, again, we're going to continue to see uh, more companies come to market. But uh, as Derek pointed out, um, I think we are going to see a significant amount of M and A activity. Um, but uh, again, I think the prospects for the sector overall are extremely positive, and uh, we will see continued maturation of these companies and uh, uh, greater acceptance uh, from uh, more traditional sectors of the investment community. What do you think? Just one more question before before we head out to the breakout session. Um, from a from a cultural standpoint and from a political standpoint, what do you think needs to happen in order to get people over the 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 hump of acceptance? Do you think it's just you know continued education? Um, you know, is it you know Joe Biden coming out and saying this is the best thing ever for veterans? What you know what is is there is there anything that that is going to happen culturally that that we think will be what takes us over to you know mainstream mainstream acceptance? Well, what I would personally like to see is um, policymakers in Canada, the United States, um, declare war on opiate addiction yeah. and take some of the money that they're getting from uh, the settlements uh, from uh, Purdue and funding uh, work. Uh, with the psychedelics community to uh, break the addiction cycle. I think that would be an extremely worthwhile post-pandemic uh, project for uh, health authorities to take on. I'm good with that one. Yeah, I think we're we're all good with that one. Um, 
Bruce, Derek, Richard, thank you so much. This has been this has been great. Um, we are going to go to a uh, head over to a breakout session um, where we'll continue the discussion um, and do some Q and A there. Um, if you go to the Pine app, um, you can head to the breakout session um, and join us there. So thank you, gentlemen. This has been a real pleasure. Welcome. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you.